So all the separate party debates. Thank you. Test, test. Can you hear me? Test. <coughs> Do I need a mic up? I think it's. I'll just speak. Uh, All right, I'll just speak. It's just low. Yeah. Is this it? Mm. Test, 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 test. It's on? All right. Glad to be here. Two of my friends were here earlier this year, Tom Woods and Jeff Tucker, so I feel like uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm uh, not the minority uh, political position for once. Um, I'll start with a quote. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom, but the tumult soon subsides. Time makes more converts than reason. Thomas Paine. I come to you as a libertarian and as a practicing patent attorney. By libertarian, I mean someone who has an opposition to injustice and aggression in a principled way, who favors just laws and rights, 
And this means self-ownership above all and ownership of private property resources. When I was a little longer than most of you are now, I came across writing by libertarians or other thinkers in favor of intellectual property. Ayn Rand, for example, a noted libertarian thinker, wrote, and I feel that way about her work on IP now. She wrote, patents are the heart and core of property rights. Now, I was persuaded at the time of private property, free markets, capitalism, but I was curious about the idea of patent and copyright being part of this free market edifice. Why should patents last for 17 years only and copyrights 80 or 100 or whatever they've gone to now? So I studied and puzzled and thought about this issue for years, for the next decade. In the time past, I went to grad school, went to law school, passed the patent bar to become a patent lawyer, which is an intellectual property lawyer. And about the time I passed the patent bar in 1994, I also came to the conclusion that patent law and copyright law should be abolished as they're totally contrary to the free market and capitalism. And so I've wrote, I wrote about it over the years, a little bit timidly at first, not to anger my professionals and my colleagues, but I found out soon they didn't read in the journals I was publishing in, so it didn't matter. I could say what I wanted to. <laughs> Okay, so this is the proposition I'd like to put to you today and to argue for. So the question is, are patent and copyright law good or bad? Should they be abolished or retained? Should they have been passed in the first place? Now, to ask the question about whether a law should be uh, in place or not, whether it's just or not, we need to know something about the law, and those, these are two kind of uh, arbitrary, arcane laws, but we also need to know a little bit about what law in general should be. And to know that, we need to know a little bit about human action, reflect a little bit about the nature of human interaction. Okay? Now, there are three books I would exhort you to read sometime in your time here at this university, if you have time. One is Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, the Austrian economist. The second is The Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard. And the third is A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism by Hans Hermann Hoppe. You should read many others, but if you could read these three books, and if I could take a big vice and squeeze them really hard and come up with the first cold press essence of these, it might look a little something like what I'm about to say. We humans act. This sounds trivial, but... Yes? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Humans act. What does this mean? That means we look at our situation in the world, we see the way things are, and we envision a future about to come. The near future, the next moment, a minute from now, an hour from now, a decade from now, and we have some idea about what's going to come. And that idea usually makes us uncomfortable. As Ludwig von Mises says, we have felt uneasiness. We don't like what's going to happen, we want to change it. So we use our knowledge and we, acquire, we gather this knowledge together and we look around us and we see what's in our environment that we can use to causally change things in the world. How can we act to interfere with the course of events to make something different happen that otherwise would happen? So we employ resources in the world in addition to our bodies and we make things happen. We act. Okay? So to act, you need to have knowledge about the laws of cause and effect and you need to have access to scarce resources, or as Mises called them, scarce means, the means of action, okay? And if we're successful in our action and we achieve the result we wanted to bring about and we prevent the event, from, the event from coming about that otherwise was going to come about, we call that a profit, or as Mises calls it, a psychic profit. In dollar terms, this is a monetary profit, but profit is a general psychological thing. When you achieve your result, you have a profit. When you fail, you have a loss. Okay. Now, this is true even of a man alone in the world, Robinson Crusoe, alone on his island. He still needs to possess things, to use his body, to use his intelligence, to use scarce resources to act. But in society, when there are other people around, there's the possibility of rivalry and conflict. Because of the nature of scarce resources, the things we have, the tools, the food, even our own bodies, there's the possibility of violent conflict over these bodies. And so that we're not always eternally fighting with each other, and so that we can have cooperation and the division of labor and some security in our resources, we develop rules that determine, in the case of this resource, who is the owner of that resource. This is the origin of law 
This is the origin of property rights. This is the purpose and function of property rights. Without a world of scarcity, in the world of land of cocaine, we would not have a need for laws. In the Garden of Eden, there would be no such thing as property or conflict or violence or property rights. But in this real world, we do have the possibility of violent conflict over our bodies and over other things. And therefore, law emerges as a way to assign ownership of these resources so that conflict is, can be avoided and so that prosperity can be achieved, so that we can live in, tree, in true society with each other. And the basic rules that we arrive at in, over time and in society through the common law, through the Roman law, through reason, through empathy with each other, through society, are the basic rules that imbue the spirit of all of society, which is, number one, self-ownership. Every person owns their, their own body, okay? as opposed to the opposite, which is slavery. Number two, for anything else that is a scarce means of action in the world, any scarce resource, the property rules basically have to be non-arbitrary so that they can be accepted as a fair means of settling, settling disputes, and they have to permit resources to first be used in the first place, which means there has to be a role for first use, which is why the property rules always say the first user of a resource has a better claim than anyone else. This is original appropriation or locking homesteading. And also, as the owner of such a thing, you have the right to do what you want with it. You can give it to someone else, donation. You can make a gift. You can sell it. You can leave it to your children. You can transfer it by contract. You can sell it, basically. These two rules are the essence of all law. When you see a resource that two or more people have a dispute over, a car, a farm, a house, you can answer who owns it by asking who had it first, who bought it. Okay, this is the foundation of all law. Now, <laughs> when you understand the nature of intellectual property rights, you will see why intellectual property rights, namely patent and copyright. I won't focus on the other manifold, manifold uh, types of IP, which include trade secret, boat hole designs, database rights, moral rights, semiconductor mask work protections, too abstruse. But patent and copyright are the two big ones, the two bad ones, the most evil ones. I have trouble deciding in my own mind which I would abolish first. Patent law does more harm on a monetary level because it retards civilization and impoverishes the world and, and reduces innovation. But on the other hand, it's like a big tax, and it only, it only lasts about 17 years per patent. Copyright, on the other hand, doesn't do as much monetary damage, but it does shackle free speech, restrict internet freedom, distort the culture, and they last over 100 years, leading to the orphan, orphan, books, work, orphan works book problem, where there are hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of books whose authors can't be found and no publisher will reprint them because they're afraid of being sued because of this archaic copyright system. To understand the system, it's useful to know a little bit about the history of patent and copyright law. Hundreds of years ago in Europe, there was a practice of the monarch, the crown, of granting protectionist patent or monopoly privilege grants to certain court cronies in exchange for favors. If you collect taxes from me, the king says, I'll let you be the only guy who can sell playing cards in this town or the only guy who can export sheepskin. This is called an, a, a letter patent, an open instruction to the, to the community that this guy is the only one who can do it. So it was just a monopoly grant. It was anti-competitive, in derogation of free trade. This is the origin of patents. It led to such abuses that Parliament in England in 1623 passed a law called, ask for it, the Statute of Monopolies. You see, back in the old days, they were a little bit more honest about their the terms of their laws. Nowadays, we call this intellectual property instead of a monopoly grant by the government, just like the Department of War has now been renamed the Department of Defense. Okay, copyright, copyright emerged when the church and the crown got a little bit nervous at the advent of the printing press because, oh no, now the scribes can't control what the people get to read, uh, so they set up a monopoly called the Stationers, Stationers Company. Uh, when that expired, uh, the Statute of Anne in 1709 was enacted, which was the basis of modern copyright law. 1789, the United States Constitution was ratified. It was actually ratified in 1789, but came into effect in 1789. Had a clause which mimicked these two ancient monopoly privilege grants by the British Crown in terms of copyright and patent, and authorized Congress to enact copyright and patent law. 
So the copyright and patent law enacted in 1790-91, right after the Constitution was ratified, uh, basically are based upon these ancient privileges, uh, these ancient practices of, of European monarchs uh, protecting their cronies from competition, restricting free trade. This is the main and principal reason to oppose patent and copyright law. Because remember, whenever there's a, dis a resource over which there's a dispute, the, the way you find out who the owner is is to ask the question, well, whose body is it if it's a body? But if it's something else, who had it first? Was there a contract? The way patent and copyright worked is, if you look up the term in the Roman law, it's called a negative servitude. Now, a servitude just means the right to use. A negative servitude is the right to stop someone from using. You're all familiar with this in the form of restrictive covenants in neighborhood associations, right? You live in a nice neighborhood. There's an agreement everyone agreed to where you can't paint your house orange or have a pig farm next door, right? So every neighbor, in effect, has a little bit of ownership of their neighbor's property in terms of a veto. It's a negative servitude. All your neighbors can prevent you from painting your house orange, okay? Now, why is this legitimate? Because, again, there was a contract. So who owns this house? I own it for most purposes. My neighbors can prevent me from painting it orange because of a contract. So you go back to the basic rules of contract. So there's nothing wrong with the negative servitude as long as there was a consent, voluntary consent, a contract. Patent and copyright effectively grant negative servitudes even though there was no consent. How, do, how does this work? If I were to publish a sequel to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged tomorrow, I would be sued by the, Leonard Peikoff and the estate of Ayn Rand for in, uh, infringing the copyright of Ayn Rand's estate because it's a derivative work. All right? In fact, The Catcher in the Rye, the, uh, actually a sequel of that was banned by a court by the estate of J.D. Salinger, and it never saw the light of day decades ago. So this is actually censorship of freedom of the press, literally book banning in the name of copyright. Patents work similarly. If I try to make an, a, a new iPhone that looks too much like the iPhone, then Apple can use its lawyers to go to court to get an, an injunction against me to keep me from using my factory as I see fit to compete with Apple. So you see, these are the same as negative servitudes, but they're not voluntarily consented to by the person who's being burdened or harmed by them. This is why patent and copyright law are totally incompatible with the free society and with natural private property rights. Now, maybe in, other, uh, in my uh, other uh, time, I can go into another field, but the argument I've just given is not the argument you'll hear, usually. Usually what you'll hear is the other argument, which is the utilitarian argument. Most people today don't think about law or property rights in terms of principle like I just laid out. They don't think about the purpose of law. They talk about how to adjust the law to maximize some, some policy goal. So the debate now is always in terms of utilitarianism. And that's actually what was written in the Constitution. To, <laughs> to promote innovation and to promote creative works, the, cop, the Congress shall have the power to grant limited monopolies to inventors and artists so as to promote them engaging in these fields. That's a utilitarian argument. So the argument is that we have a legal system, it's working fine, we're all free beings, but the government needs to step in because we think that there's an underproduction of novels and paintings, and we think there's an underproduction of music, and we think there's an underproduction of innovation. So the government is going to selectively grant monopolies to people to give them an extra incentive to do just a little bit more. Now, in the 200 plus years since the advent of the Constitution uh, in, the, in this country, there has been no empirical studies that conclusively show that this is the case. The burden of proof by the utilitarians has simply not been met. In fact, every student study that's not inconclusive indicates to the contrary. Patents slow down innovation. They prevent people from competing. Copyrights restrict free speech. And they're threatening the internet, freedom of the internet, which is one of the most important tools we free citizens have to fight the intrusions of the state. So anything that threatens the freedom of the internet, namely copyright, should be fought tooth and nail, which is why it's a good thing Trump took us out of the TPP for the wrong reasons he took us out of the TPP because he's against free trade and for copyright, but luckily he took us out of the TPP because the, the TPP was going to impose American-style enhanced copyright sanctions on the rest of the world for the advantage of the recording industry, the music industry, Hollywood, and the pharmaceutical companies. So I'll rest my case here, and we'll be happy to take any other questions.
claim is that we could exist in a world where we don't have patent protections and there still will be innovation. But America, since the founding of the Constitution, has always had patent protection. And since most of the Western world has also had some sort of patent protection, how can the guests make the claim that there will be uh, the same amount of like of innovation if it cannot be protected and it cannot be monetized? Where, where does the evidence for this uh, come from, since we've only lived in a world where there has barely been patent protection in recent memory? Yes, so first of all, I would say that the purpose of law is to do justice, not to make sure we have enough innovation. Uh, second of all, I would say that there can be no serious argument that without patents we would have no innovation. We would have some level of innovation. So the burden of proof should be on someone advocating a very costly policy, which costs the U.S. economy at least $70 billion a year, according to many studies, because of patent trolls and other problems like this. The burden of proof has to be on the person advocating a positive policy to show that the benefit, the net benefit of that policy is greater than the cost. It's never been shown, and reason leads us to think uh, the uh, opposite. It's, it's hard, it's counterintuitive, it's counter, counters a reason to believe that by protecting an innovator from competition and making it illegal for other people to innovate in that area and to compete with them, that we would have more innovation. There's been a confusion in property theory since John Locke. John Locke essentially argued that we own ourselves, which a phrase I use as well to save time, but the, the technical term is we own our bodies. When you say you own yourself, it's more of a metaphysical concept, and then you are naturally led to say we own our labor because we produce our labor. And if you own your labor, you own things that you mix with it. This is the mistake in Locke's theory the idea that creation is a source of rights. Creation is not a source of property rights. Property rights are always rights in scarce resources over which there can be conflict and the rules have to answer the question about who owns the thing. Those rules are exhaustively handled by the first use and the contract uh, rules. Uh, you have to understand, as I mentioned about Mises, the, the structure of human action. Successful human action requires two things. It requires knowledge and it requires the availability to control scarce resources. The scarce resources are things that people can conflict over. If I come up with a recipe of a new way to bake a cake, anyone else who learns that recipe can use it at the same time as me. There's no conflict possible over that. And to give me ownership, an idea is, is always a feature of an object. Idea can never be stored up in the ether. It's always an empatterning of, a pro of an object that's already owned by someone. It would be like me owning a balloon that's red and therefore owning red. So if I owned red, because I owned a red balloon, it means I own everyone else's red car or red balloon. You can't own features of things, only the physical characteristics of those things. Okay, so. The, the concept of fraud is, is just simply a, a consequence of property rights and contract. Fraud simply means, in, a, in essence, theft by trick. If you deceive someone about what you're giving them in payment or in exchange for an object they own and they transfer that object to you when you misled them about something, then the, the, the title to the object that's being given to you is not being given knowingly or without deceit. And therefore, the title is false, and I'm now in... in basically in possession of stolen property. That's the basis of any proper law against fraud. It doesn't just mean lying, but you'll see defenders of intellectual property, patent, and copyright, they will accuse people that are against these laws of being in favor of fraud. But fraud actually has nothing to do, fraud has more to do with trademark law rather than patent and copyright. Fraud has nothing to do with copyright or patent infringement. Copyright means if I copy what you did, 
even if I tell the truth about who the owner was. If I copy a Harry, a Harry Potter novel and I don't, I don't put my name on the cover, I put your name on the cover, it's not fraud, but it's still copyright infringement. If I copy an iPhone, I'm not pretending to be Steve Jobs, but I'm still guilty of patent infringement. So fraud has nothing to do with patent or copyright. I do believe fraud should be illegal under libertarian law, but only because it's implicit theft, not because uh, you're pretending to, you're not because you're competing with someone or borrowing or copying off their work. Yes. Sorry. <laughs>
when an individual, particularly a smaller company, creates something that's vastly innovative, and then they have to go through the great expense, and admittedly, I am part of those great expenses, that some may have to take to protect their innovation. But with that, once it's protected, once they've made that capital investment, I believe they have a right, and I assert they do have a right, to protect it, to defend it, and to have a framework by which we all accept it. It does not stop you from having a great idea. IP, and let's demystify sort of this mythology, isn't about keeping someone from being able to have an idea. The problem is we don't get rewarded for keeping our ideas on the shelf. If I want you to bring it out of the dark and bring it into the light, then you've got to think there's something in it for you. In it could be health. It could be bringing a vast pool of innovation so that we can change our healthcare system for the better. And it could be a great writing so that we're able to go in and say, literary works should not be just for a few. They should have access to the whole. And the best way to provide that access, absolutely, is from the internet and being able to have mass dissemination. But it's also being able to say, when that one smart person puts a pay point on their website and they start getting compensated for my work, I get a cut of that too. Tesla is known for sharing their IP, but they also received money from 13 patents when someone else got credit for creating the radio. This is not about saying I want to hold and hoard what I create. It's about saying I want to be rewarded for my innovation in a means in which I choose, and even if I don't choose to do it, I have the right to do it. We all have a social construct in which we're living. We all give a little to be part of the greater society. We may not like all of the giving that we have to do, and some of us may feel that some of this giving is a bit excessive. And again, intellectual property can be reworked in some areas, but it's certainly not a framework that we want to toss out. So going back to sort of how we're looking at even using the John Locke example and having the debate about property and where intellectual property rights fall in the midst of property. It gets a little bit circular. So we've got some people who would argue IP is not property to begin with. We have others that say it's not that we don't think that it's property, but we think that it limits our right to use our property. So that's another argument. Then you have some who say, even if it is property, it's not the type of property that can be protected. And to that I would start and I would say yes. Typically I am not the one who wants to go around quoting John Locke or Blackstone, but even our Supreme Court is having to do it right now. They are looking at it in a case that is going over whether or not true and this is in a sense whether or not patents can be determined as property, but more so it's how we adjudicate property rights if in fact they do exist. So let's take this particular case, which is sitting before the Supreme Court now and sort of what they're evaluating and the danger and essentially saying that extensions of ourselves, whether they're creative works, whether they are health proprietary works, whether particularly they are trademarks, because they are selfishly, if we want nothing else, not as inventors, but as consumers, what we want is to be able to get what we essentially have paid for. Trademarks aren't there to protect just the person who's made this name or logo. Trademarks are there so that when you are going out and you think you're getting it, you get what you thought you were going to get. And in a world where so frequently we don't get what we thought we were going to get, the least we can do is get it when we're expending monetary capital to buy and support a company. So then what we end up having here with the Supreme Court case is a switch in terms of how they're reviewing. And this is where it gets a little bit convoluted and I apologize, but that's one of the problems with patent, trademark, IP. It's not IP itself, it's the human factor of how we've decided to legislate and go over it. And to the point about legislation, what's our issue more so, more often than not, it's not that intellectual property is not clear, it's that the legislative drafting determining how we run our intellectual property organizations have been drafted. If we want to command more, it's that we command less from IP, it's that we command more from the statutes that are being drafted to protect our rights in intellectual property. But going back, so essentially, this particular case hinges on how someone can review a patent claim. Right now, they, I hate to say it, but it's incredibly expensive for one to adjudicate a patent case, and so because of that, to stop and quell the litigation, they have what's called an inter partes procedure, which allowed an administrative body to come in, and instead of having to go to federal court, you could go. That administrative body would determine your rights in the patent, and that could alleviate a lot of the cost prohibitive factors that play with intellectual property. In this particular instance, someone filed a patent, 
We'll call them client A and client B to keep it a little bit, a, a little less convoluted. You have party A filed a patent, that patent was granted. Party B came in, they essentially infringed, or so party A suggested. They went before this inter partes procedure. Through that inter partes procedure, the court or that administrative body found that the patent, not only did they have a right to use it, but it was invalid to begin with. They removed the patent from party A retroactively, and now we're before the Supreme Court. Essentially, the argument being, an administrative body does not have the right to take away my property. My property should be determined in a federal court as the Constitution would suggest. Whether it's administrative or whether there's a federal court, we'll know in 2018. But what I can say is that the weakness of IP does exist in it being cost prohibitive. But the idea that property is not an extension or IP is not an extension of ourselves is a fallacy that I cannot promote. Ideas are one of the key components and one of the best things about our American system of education. What did we try and hold on to? We try and hold on to innovation. What was the one thing, or continues to be, though I don't know how often it will be or how long it will be, how long this will last, our innovation and our ability to ideate is special and unique. And the reason it's special and unique is because almost everyone can say, I could have come up with that. That's a great idea, I could have come up with that. Dan Brown, who's an author who we are familiar with for the Da Vinci Code, was cited in doing work in his most recent book, and it's focused on modern art. And so to draft this book, he spent a lot of time focused on modern art. And he walked through a modern art museum, and there was a white canvas with two circles that were red in the corner. And as he walked through, he said, which I think most of us probably would, I could have made that. And to that, the curator said, but you didn't. What we're protecting here is not what someone can do. What we're protecting is what you actually do. But it's the execution and your ability to monetize that. And when we give you and allot those rights to you, then the question is, OK, so if it's not that intellectual property isn't property, but it's that by you stating that it's property, you are infringing on my right to do what I want with my property. So let's address that next. You can do, essentially, pretty much whatever you want in your house. If I were to take this coat and I would dazzle it and I do whatever I want and I look like I'm about to be a star from the 80s, I have my right to do it. The issue comes into play not with the fair use of what I do with this coat. It's when I walk out of my house and I decide to say I want to sell it to you and you and you and you. I actually am making this. That's the infringement. It's not so much that anyone is objecting to the use of material or the creativity that extends from it. It's when we start messing with the monetary profit sharing and not saying there are constraints for that. And what are the constraints? Licensing. It is a myth that people cannot innovate, iterate, and create within a construct of intellectual property. The innovation is being able to innovate, create, and iterate within those parameters and doing something that still exists outside of them. The telecom telephone industry existed before Steve Jobs came up with the iPhone, yet we found it to be an innovative, different way of looking at the phone. Again, if we all could have done it, arguably, the argument is we would have. But it took one, the slippery slope, which is a positive in this instance, slippery slope of stating it's not just that we don't need to have a phone that gives us a clock. We don't need to have a phone that also has voicemail. We don't need to have a phone that takes great pictures. It's that when it's produced and provided to the consumer, do they buy it? And then when they do, who gets the money and the reward for that? The people who ideated and spent the money in R&D and then provided to all of us so we can say we can make it better. And if we do, then what can we do within the construct of IP that's legal, that doesn't offend someone else's property rights, is we can license the technology we want, and we're as great as we think we are, we can create where we think it's going. We build upon, and the checks and balances of IP, which is also so we do here, is that we don't get this big, long-needed period of pure hoarding. It's not that we get to have our great ideas and no one can touch it into perpetuity. It is blocked and protected by time. There are windows of that ownership. And as we go and sort of evolve with new technologies, 3D printing, AI, we start looking at, okay, so where are the lines drawn? Because AI is going to be able, and I've had this discussion recently, to not only take what I put in as a program or my algorithm, but it's also going to be able to take all the data that's available through an IBM, what is it, Winston, 
give them capital W because it could be a trademark name. But from the W product that allows AI to come in and provide additional information at a certain point in time, we will have a combined embodiment of mutual intellect, literature, mathematics, physics, ranging from physics to calculus to philosophy, all sitting there detecting what we would do as a society and then throwing it out there and who gets to own that. Well, the truth is, the programmer will own a piece of it. The person who wrote that, wrote that it's comp the compilation will have a piece of it, and we have to be comfortable with that. And if we aren't comfortable with it, then the cure is not in demolishing the construct, it's fixing it. The foundation is solid, even if the walls are a bit flailing. So we have a situation where we know John Locke was on to something. It was that there's a circular argument here, but whether it's property, whether it infringes on your rights, it is property. Does it infringe on your rights? No. The same way that saying you can go as fast as you want to in your car, but we will put up speed limits. No, you don't have free freedom, but you do have freedom within the constructs. So in ending, should intellectual property be abolished? Well, I don't think you can throw the baby out with the bathroom. I also don't think that you can look at it in a silo. Patents do need work. Copyrights have an extension of time that allows merit to the argument that as they stand, they are imperfect, but they are certainly valuable. Because while a person who was paid previously through a patronage system in the arts world and was a musician so could get performing rights payment, what happens to the author? Are we paying them to read their novel out loud? That was not historically what was happening. A person who was drafting their work was not able to receive the monetary benefit of the time that they invested in the work. That type of authorship should be rewarded. It shouldn't be rewarded because it makes us viscerally feel good. It should be rewarded because it creates a level of innovation and interactive thought that builds our intellectual community. Communities that then can also be licensed, copyrighted, protected, and expanded. We as a society grow within our construct when we protect the work, creative and otherwise, of ingenuity. And we recognize that great ideas are a scarce resource. If we thought that they were flooding like Niagara Falls, maybe we would not need to produce it. But the reality is, when we talk about great companies, we talk about them in silos. There is a Google. There is a Walmart. All trademark names. And the reason they went through the business of trademarking them is otherwise we'd be saying there would be great algorithm. Any algorithm. Are we all using every algorithm? No, we're using a few. There are product identifiers and they have value. Our constructs have value. We need to work to improve them, but we don't need to work to eradicate.
directly correlated to monetary reward, but I would venture to say in present day, as opposed to historically, ingenuity is enhanced and encouraged when you know that your hard work will be rewarded by virtue of, by an array of a lot of things, whether it's an acquisition, whether it's changing healthcare for the better. I think all of those things are incentivized in different ways, but even the person who has the most altruistic message still will be paid handsomely if they sell their drug to a strong pharmaceutical company. So it's hard for me to extrapolate a non-monetary component to it when in present day, there is a great monetary component that's tied to even the most altruistic vertical. But historically, yes, I believe that ingenuity evolved from need and necessity. Further questions? Um, uh, Mr. Sharma. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, the guest would define um, copyrights
So perhaps the final question. Um, yes, Laura. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, I want to talk about uh, genetic um, ties. Mm -hmm. uh, there seem to be many cases where a patient will have a certain genetic <coughs> that is naturally occurring, and um, uh, uh, innovators will take that um, genetic that is naturally in that person and add them to their own. Uh, does the lady believe that uh, the person who, who uh, where's the So, I mean, that reminds me a lot of Kendra as well, right? And, and people owning their food. And sort of, when we start looking at removing laws, we always have to look at who's harmed by the removal of laws. So I would always venture to say that anything that's considered exotic tends to be appropriated, and that people who own that should have a right to monetize it in a way that respects them and respects sort of their culture and the parameters in which that lies. Within patents, I feel the same way, but in a very different way. I mean, it, you're using the example of DNA cells. I could go so far as to say the same thing for food. I think it's very dangerous when we start having organizations who are owning the patents and the, essentially the genetic marker for food. Um, if you spend time creating the perfect apple, should you be able to reap the reward of it? Absolutely. But should you be able to bankrupt a farmer who, through nature alone, has now usurped that way. I think we need to carve out exceptions for that. I think you should be rewarded for innovation, but I don't think you can manipulate a system so that you then disenfranchise other people. Uh, wrong thing, right? Um, now, when it comes to DNA and cells, full disclosure, I'm not a patent attorney. So I, my, and so I draw the line in terms of really understanding how the genetic markers go and how similar all of us are in DNA structures to really do a, an honest breakdown of how much of what I have in mind, and then where we distinguish, because if I had a twin, then we would share, right? We would share such a substantial amount of that. Who owns it? You know, my twin. And what happens if my twin and I don't get along? So I, I can't, it's a slope that I can't go down enough uh, to articulate fairly, but I would say that any scientist or institution, and I think John Hawkins had an issue with this, with him and Anna laughing, we all visited him. But should we be honest, um, the issue there is not so much the ability to utilize those cells, it's the honesty and reaping the monetary benefit. And again, when we have the contracts, the most essentially were licensed without payment. So what they were owed is restitution. So we're not saying you can't use them. I believe that innovation and science is critical, and how else are we going to be able to get these cells? But we all, especially with HIPAA, buy into that. We don't have it thrust upon us. So we have to openly come in and say we consent to that use, not have it taken from us and then not receive the monetary benefit of it when another institution does. So from a biopharmaceutical standpoint, do I think someone else has the right to own it? I use it personally myself? Absolutely not. But do I think if they offered me and we have the right to contract that we contractually agreed and I was told I'll receive a percentage for a spray? I mean, I have the right contractually to yay or nay that, and I believe all everyone in a free market should have the right to make that decision. And with that, we'll cook this thing. Some garage tinkerer comes up with the next Facebook in her garage. 
or whatever your social media approach is. She copyrights her work and patents her award-winning algorithms. It's the whole enchilada. She makes a lot of money and then goes on to be responsible and gives some of it away, etc., etc. Many adherents to the doctrine of intellectual property take the story to look to be normal and natural. Of course someone who makes something cool and new should be for profits. But how did our hypothetical innovator have the time or the resources to do this? Was she supported by her family? Did her local library have coding classes? Did she have a stable work schedule that gave her both benefits and the time required to pursue her own interests? The wealth system that allows certain people to be innovators are precisely the people who are protected by the intellectual property system. The communities that paid for our innovator to go to school and live before they moved into a position to become innovators are just as responsible for the innovation as the individual. If you think this is a, lo a load of baloney, do you genuinely think that the reason more innovations have come from wealthy places is because of the greater concentration of genius there? Or is it because innovation takes money and support and resources? The continued existence, not of innovation, but of intellectual property, is not natural or universal, but is a choice made by the state. This choice right now primarily protects the largest, wealthiest companies in the US. Many people argue that intellectual property as a legal category protects small artists, without regard to the fact that small artists can't afford to stay enmeshed in intellectual property models, and that companies are aggressive with attacking the local music makers and your uh, Yale Facebook meme creators that use ideas of theirs in ongoing innovative processes. Intellectual property is a fiction that is designed to privilege the innovations of a certain type of person operating in a particular place. Innovations and creations happen every day. The hyper-individualization of our society operates through people needing to accumulate awards and kudos and profit, and intellectual property serves precisely this function. Imagine, for a hot sec, a world in which people continue to be creative and work to solve their own problems. As this could pointed out, people solve problems, they create things to address needs in their lives. Um, but a certain set of sub subset in this world, a certain subset of people, pardon me, don't use legal fictions to accumulate wealth and prestige. If all the innovations that are the cumulative life works of hundreds of people were free to use without any restrictions, imagine what our kids could come up with. Since we live in an inter interconnected world, it makes sense to encourage the growth and development of more innovations built on others. This requires the abolition of intellectual property. Questions for the former president of the union, uh, Ms. Collier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I agree with Ms. Murphy that the current US copyright law system is horrendously misaligned. Why there is a meaningful difference in her mind between company gives me money. 
money to do research and teacher gives me skills to do research that ought to make one of those totally ethically bad and the other totally ethically good. Yeah, so this relates to my answer to uh, Ms. Collier um, about how the profit-seeking motive of companies that it relies on exploiting the labor of workers, the reason it funds research at all is because it thinks it can make dramatically more money. Like, this is, this is true. Um, like, research is funded because companies see a profit motive in it, which means that the research, the money that goes into the research is, like, necessarily going to be less than the money that they're going to get out of it. That's, like, why they invest in that research, and is also why, like, I care less about their, like, return on investment rather than, com rather than communities and things that see no profit-seeking motive in supporting people to innovate and be creative. Uh, what about Miss Murphy? Uh, Miss Murphy is thing. Even the sciences do and should 
recognize individuals who bring about great discoveries. Um, I would say that the rush to publish a work once you have um, an amazing discovery doesn't only mean that you're excited to share your work with humanity. There's a level, there is a sense that you're proud that your group that put in 20 years, 30 years into this discovery made it. You showed that it was all worth it. And I would say that's a very positive thing to have in a society. Um, so IP rights, to conclude, are a healthy aspect of a society and an economy that believes that intellectual creations are worth rewarding. And with that, I yield to questions. Questions. The speaker mentioned the necessity of patents because of the crushing cost imposed on pharmaceutical companies by the FDA. Would the speaker be in favor of eliminating the FDA and also all, all corporate income taxes to reduce the cost on these corporations so that patents are not necessary to subsidize the cost already imposed on them by the state? a very good sign of where we are in, in medical science today. Um, people, some of the more, some of the most expensive things to create treatments for are things that, at our level of science, we've done things like eliminate smallpox, we've done things like create vaccines for polio. People tend to not die of pneumonia, and these are all really excellent advancements. The stakes and the standards are much, much higher. Um, and I'd say that to a certain extent, it's kind of it's a good sign that I, as someone who, may ha who might buy like a small lab kit from Amazon, probably can't make the cure for AIDS in my, in my lab. I wish I could. I really wish I could, but it's such a hard, difficult problem that it really dem demands all those resources. And the FDA is there to make sure that because with drugs, you're, all, you're playing with life and death, we can vet these, these, um, that these medicines that do come to the market aren't causing harm, even more harm than the actual diseases themselves. Appropriate motion. The motion. I move that we thank Ms. Chindu for a fine presentation for the Yale Foundation. Is there perhaps another speech in the affirmative? First speech. Mr. Diaz. So, uh, 
intellectual property laws um, place more power in the hands of corporations to control the ways that consumers uh, use art and don't actually give artists more control over uh, or more revenue for their work. Uh, in, in fact, empowering in cor corporations like Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google through um, something called digital uh, the, so digital restrictions management, is like I, I typically call digital rights management, um, it forces artists, especially small artists, to give control over their products to these streaming services. Um, so intellectual property laws grant legitimacy to certain corporations to regulate the ways that users can access products like songs. So when a consumer streams music, they, do not, they don't buy a record or a cassette tape or something physical like an, or even an MP3, all of which the consumer can use as, as they see fit. Um, instead, the streaming company determines how songs can be used. And so, for example, I, I use Apple Music to stream most of my music. Uh, and but, so before streaming, I would download an MP3, um, sometimes legally, sometimes not, um, that could, I, I could put onto my computer or my iPod, or, you know, and I, I can use it as I want. I can share it with friends, I can, you know, like another product I can use. Um, but now that I stream, Apple restricts how I can consume music, um, that I can only do it on certain devices and certain software, and neither me nor the artist has control over where the product is distributed. Um, so the music industry has pushed more towards streaming because it enables consumers to pay uh, for the streaming service for its the legal streaming uh, rather than the, the artist the record label for the products. Um, so because um, it provides more music for less money, it's become a dominating field. Um, but these corporations have, uh, th this, this actually has made corporations like, like the streaming services um, necessary for artists to even survive in a lot of cases. Um, they, so like, especially small artists have to get, have to be streaming. Um, and they, they, there's, you know, the, Mr. Kinsella mentioned, you know, the consensual contracts. I don't think that there's a whole lot of consent that goes on if you want to be an artist um, who sell, who just produces music. And this is just a lo uh, streaming is just like one case of like a longer extension of the control of uh, industry and in determining how artists can share their music. So, for example, like in the early 20th century, um, you know, singers would be paid like maybe 50 bucks to do a song, and they get no royalties, and the recording industry would make all all the money off of it. Um, and I, I think recording is an interesting case because what it does is it does sort of dissociate the labor from the product. So, you know, especially in recording, you can sing a song one time and, you know, it can be shared in all, all these cases. And I, I think that the problem in the record, record industry is that, in the recording industry is that, um, specifically is that the streaming services make it so you have to, you basically have to be streaming. You can't actually sell records um, like you used to be able to. And um, the, tr the true problem is that artists have no control over the industry. Um, and I, I think, uh, so even in the capitalist system, uh, you know, the abolishing motion. the motion. I move we give Mr. Diaz an additional 30 seconds. Second. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what the alternative to a capitalist system then, because I have that. Um, so I think part of the problem is uh, that, you know, only in a, in a system where you have to be working constantly to survive is the problem of starving artists, even if, like, even the, the, the fact that in a universal basic income, if there was a universal basic income, which is not necessarily uncapitalistic, um, you can actually have, uh, you know, artists be, being able to control their work um, while also having, uh, you know, the, their, their uh, livelihoods perspective. Okay. Questions for Mr. Diaz. Uh, Mr. Malik.
I, I didn't clarify this well enough in my speech. I, I think that um, the point of what I'm saying is that not that intellectual property is what protects artists, but, the, but we should be shifting artists, the, the way we can see of artists and other innovators like scientists and, and whatever, as laborers and not as, uh, not as the owners of their intellectual property. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think that in, in the modern, so, uh, you know, I'm gonna geek out a little bit about music history. So I, I think, you know, there's been other ways that music, musicians have made money, and, and even today, uh, there, was, there was only a really brief period in history where musicians made most of their money through recording. Um, so, you know, oftentimes it would either be through touring, like, you know, the vaudeville circuit was the biggest industry, not the biggest, but one of the, the biggest, it, it, it was the biggest entertainment industry. Um, you know, they also were, for example, um, hired by clubs to play in regular clubs. Even, even the most famous um, musicians were hired this way, and they were laborers of that club. So I, I think, and now, nowadays, I, I think that there was, I, so there was a brief period when, when recording really shot off that um, that was, became like the primary way of the musicians being, made the money. Um, but that's now not becoming the case again. In, in most cases, they're, again, going back to this situation where the mo most of the money you make is through touring or through selling merchandise. So I think, so I think what I'm saying here is that like, the intellectual property is, the, the, the reason I, I think that it should be abolished in this case um, is because it actually does not free the musicians or the artists or the innovators from the, um, to, like free them to control their art in, in, in the ways that I, I think that some of the previous speeches wanted. It just controls the consumers and it controls how we can consume our, um, our, our the things that we pay for. Um, and I think that that's a justifiable well, reason to abolish intellectual property. Um, and with that, Mr. Beard, Laws indicate that we think that people own 
have, have sort of the ownership over their own ideas in much the same way that we think that people own their ideas when we talk about plagiarism. So if plag we have to say plagiarism, we say like, okay, this person, this is this person's idea, this is this person's work, um, they have rights that you can't just claim it as your own. In the same way, we don't want people being able to for feeding corporations saying, um, you know, we have to say this is your mine and not yours. And so I think that we just need to fix the problems within the system and it does protect those that we think it's being harmed by the system. Questions for Ms. Smith. Uh, Ms. Murphy. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Would Ms. Smith be in favor of the creation of some federal agency or something like that, that whose job it is, like, I, I know this sounds amazing, but whose job is to speak out these, these cases where um, people that created artists, that people that created music, like small artists, mm -hmm. like, could petition the government to ask for help fighting these corporate lawyers? Like, is this a solution that she would be in favor of, or is it, like, bad for other reasons? I'm just curious. Uh, I don't like federal agencies. Um, but, but I think that some, I think that, I think it, some federal agencies are good, some are, some are inefficient, et cetera, et cetera. Problems with the housing, urban development, system department, you know. Um, but I would say, I don't think it should be the, a federal agency. I think that we have a good culture of nonprofits here. Um, there are plenty, of, there are nonprofits that bail people out of jail because they were wrongfully in prison. We have, they have nonprofits who are willing to go into all these different areas and educate people on different problems. So I think that like, if we just encourage people to, if we have, if we give people in from, give people information through that way, and then that make another bureaucratic arm of the government to do this, then I'd be fine with it. Oh, actually, is there a motion? No, 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 I spoke this up. Oh, Another speech in the affirmative. Ms. Lowry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Anyway, um, so I'm going to first define a word, and that would, well, two words. And those two words are transformative works, and then like move on. Um, so it's clear from the way people reacted earlier in the audience um, that a good number of people in this room have had an anime phase at some point. <laughs>
original creators wouldn't make anyway, filling a niche in the market. Um, um, and like, for example, just because I may read Star Wars, I guess Star Wars fan fiction doesn't mean I'm not gonna go see the next movie um, because like the next movie is valuable, like separate from like. <laughs>
uh, to profit out of their own ideas. What I think that intellectual property right, laws are really valuable in doing is one, showing society's respect for art and creative works, um, and two, allowing artists to make a living off of doing that without having to treat it as a side hobby or scraping food. Um, I think that probably a lot of us can agree that art has some sort of value, um, whether it's like broadening our horizons, um, making us think about ourselves more, um, think about ideas. There are a number of ways that we've tried to encourage it. I think one of the most important is in allowing artists to be able to treat it as a real career instead of something that parents discourage people from taking college. Um, I think our mindset when it comes to art is really important in how we treat art. Um, if we look at art as something that we take for granted as free, um, if we just think that we should be entitled to profit off of somebody else's ideas or to piggyback off of them, um, then I think it's the wrong way to view art and there would be nothing there to really encourage young artists to continue pursuing that. Um, this is not to say that no one would do art anymore, but I think that it would be detrimental to our goals of encouraging more art. Um, so for those reasons, I think that while intellectual property laws may be getting in the way of some like AMV productions or whatever, I think those are things that can be tweaked and changed um, and not necessarily something that should be completely abolished when it is true that like we've solved those problems when it comes to most of fan fiction. Um, I'm confident that we can keep the good parts of intellectual property without um, the bad. Questions for Ms. Liu. Um, Mr. Sylvester. There are two things I want to say over this. The first one, I think, uh, one way to, to uh, perhaps 
see how this intuition plays out is I think that, at least for me, I think that uh, a small artist, a small innovator has a greater claim over the fruits of their intellectual labor than does a big pharmaceutical company. And I think that if one way to make sense of this uh, intuition uh, is to observe that the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company has a lot of privilege that the small artist, the small innovator does not have. Uh, what I think also is interesting with this way to result in tension is that it's, I think, actually consistent with uh, Locke's theory of, of, pro of property. I think that one, one premise that Locke offers that is often overlooked is uh, his idea that uh, there are limits in how much one should uh, own. Uh, there, uh, one should not own more than one needs to survive. Um, and I think that uh, re recognizing the privilege, uh, as I'm suggesting, uh, maps very well into, into this intuition that, that Locke uh, has. Uh, and, and with that, I'll be able to questions. Question for Maxi. Um, Ms. Robin Clark. So I haven't really thought through how one could actually implement this. I think there are proxies that one could use to measure the amount of privilege that uh, someone who makes the intellectual property claim can make. I think uh, perhaps the, I don't know, the financial resources that the uh, actor has can be a good proxy to this, this amount of privilege. Again, I think the pharmaceutical company has a much smaller claim to uh, seeing their intellectual uh, labor come as property as does the small artists or independent innovator. And with that, my sweet mate is thank um, um, I'll take Miss Collier's speech. So I study early modern literature, and I want to talk a little bit about the conditions of literary production in early modern Europe, which were that no one made a red cent for their writing. The possible exception here is Erasmus of Rotterdam, and that was an atypical situation for any number of reasons. But no one did, which means that if you wanted to write or produce any significant intellectual output, you had to either be independently wealthy or be affiliated with some institution, usually the church, or have an aristocratic patron who would support you. Those were your options. Obviously, this was detrimental to the variety and content of literary production, of intellectual production, of political speech available at the time. It was just not feasible to support yourself if you were not affiliated with some kind of power structure. And when copyright laws started to be invented, it still wasn't to benefit writers, it was to benefit printers. And this actually made a lot of sense because early modern printing was incredibly expensive. Like casting type was expensive, setting type is, is expensive, and, lab and labor consuming, the vast majority of printers went bankrupt, Gutenberg went bankrupt, and so it was initially printers who worked to ensure that the works that they were producing were not could not be produced by anyone else because it meant they couldn't like actually succeed financially. And this, I think, um, is illuminating when you want to think about intellectual property as a kind of um, means of production, as I think um, several of the um, speakers on the left have done tonight. And if you're looking at someone like Gutenberg or Frobert or um, Frobert or whoever, it's pretty clear that the intellectual property, the writing, is not the means of production. The press is. And the reason why printers could make tons of money off popular works while the writers who produced those works made nothing was because they controlled the physical, limited resource that was needed to produce physical copies of the books which were oversold. And the modern equivalent of this is like movie studios, right? Anything with an, like a complicated, expensive apparatus that is needed to produce content. And like this should make it obvious why it is kind of incoherent to say that a socialist who opposes property rights should be opposed to intellectual property rights. Because the limiting factor on reproducing content is not the creative, is not the creative side. It's the, again, like the physical production side. And like the second problem here is that the app has a pretty serious bathwater problem. Which they're saying that writers, artists, musicians don't, are, are not properly compensated for their work under an existing intellectual property rights framework. And so we should abolish this all together. This is craziness. Like, the problem is not, like, I, I completely agree that U.S. intellectual property laws are grossly misaligned, that corporations benefit more than individuals, that copyright protection should not extend past the death of the author, that their use needs to be much more strongly protected, um, all of that, like, that's correct. 
But what that means is that we need to work towards an intellectual property system. No. Intellectual property system, an intellectual property system where individuals can actually be compensated for their work. Because I agree with Mr. Diaz that art is labor. And that means that artists should be properly compensated for their labor. <coughs> right? But ultimately, I don't want to make a property argument. I think that like the, the, the thing that is at stake here is not our definition of property rights, it's whether or not creators are an infinitely exploitable resource. And conversely, whether everyone has the right to access a piece of work because it is easy to reproduce. And I think this is something that the internet, the fact that modern printing is incredibly cheap, obscures a little bit. Like, no one would have thought this in 1600. It's obvious that, like, an incredible amount of labor and effort cost outlay. Uh, <laughs> questions? <laughs> um, I'll take Mr. Crowd. All right, thank you. Just a few concluding remarks. Justice is the desire to render to everyone their due, right? This is the ancient Roman maxim. What their due is is based upon what their rights are. All rights are property rights, as Murray Rothbard explained. Okay, so the essence of my position is in defense of property rights, and capitalism, properly understood, is the institutionalized of respect for private property rights. Socialism is the institutionalized aggression against or violation of private property rights. So <laughs> would the socialists out there please stop agreeing with me? <laughs> I have enough problems already. Um, second, for the people that use the fraud and the plagiarism arguments, fraud is already against the law, and breach of contract is already a claim. So you already have laws against fraud. Why do we need patent, copyright, and trademark to stop it? So that's not the reason for these laws. As for the idea of students being exploited because of these IP agreements, if there were no patent law, if there were no patent laws, these students would be able to compete with their former professors in universities without hindrance by the state. Okay, you cannot have intellectual property and property rights any more than you can have welfare rights and natural property rights because welfare rights have to be paid for by someone and you have to take their other property away to pay for it. Just like when you inflate the money supply, you debase the value of currency. When you inflate rights, you make other rights worth less. Okay. You cannot say that ideas should be property just because they're created. There's a natural distinction between tangible resources and between ideas. Dogs know that their bowls are their property, but even birds don't try to copyright their songs. As for, let's modify the copyright law and patent law, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, if it's Rosemary's baby, you might want to do that. <laughs> Finally, uh, the famous, in some circles, 19th century left libertarian anarchist Benjamin Tucker, who was opposed to intellectual property, he pointed out that if you scatter money on the street and the people pick it up, you can't complain that they've done so. Likewise, if you release your ideas into the commons and people build on that and compete with you, you have no complaint. As he said, if you want your, if you want your ideas to yourself, keep them to yourself. Thank you.
provide an avenue for monetary power. It can also provide those who do not have monetary power with a way to enforce the belief without actually having to expend upon it. The most recent example I can give is the scenario we have with Pepe the Frog. <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with Senor Pepe, but Pepe the Frog was an animated cartoon that was utilized originally in a cartoon, and it was usurped originally, allegedly, but the courts have found that to be true, or really the settlement has had the infringer admit to their infringement and their wrongdoing. But essentially, it was usurped by the alt-right. The alt-right ended up using Pepe the Frog to promote their beliefs and their positions in terms of, in this that particular case, Arab Muslims. Well, there was a lawsuit by the originator of Pepe the Frog who said Pepe is a cool dude, but Pepe is not on the side of the alt-right and they do not appreciate him being usurped. He went in, he litigated. He litigated not just with monetary rights because he did not really have the money for the law firm that he retained, which speaks to protecting your rights being a bit expensive. But that's where public interest attorneys can come in. I will freely admit I am not traditionally one of those attorneys, but there are many who are. Came in and fought for the right of him saying it was his work. It was his work, it was affixed, and it was not to be usurped or infringed upon specifically in the manner in which it was done. Not only did they disagree with the messaging, but they also dis he disagreed with it being utilized. He prevailed. And he ended up having the assets and the monetary restitution that he received from the infringement used to support Muslim Arab organizations that the alt-right had to then pay for. The avenue and the use of power by using your strength of mind and intellect to create something that then can be used for good or evil is yours and yours alone. It should be protected. It should be fixed. We do not have a perfect system. We have an imperfect system, but that is appropriate because it is a system within the construct of America, and it too is an imperfect situation that we don't need to toss. We need to perfect and work upon. <laughs>